Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Aditya. Uh, I'm a partner at Game Changer Law Advisors. By profession, I'm a corporate lawyer, and I will try to do something which most lawyers fail at uh, miserably, which is keeping it short and sweet, and not boring uh, you guys. So, I actually I was studying to be an engineer, and uh, thankfully uh, uh, I, I was studying at a, tut at a tutorial in Delhi, where uh, Mr. Bansal over there was kind enough to inform my parents after one year that this bacha won't ever step foot into an IIT. So at that point they said, okay, what do you want to do? I said I wanted to become a lawyer. They said, go for it. Well, Mr. Bansal was right in a way and now he was wrong in a way. I've stepped foot in an in 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 IIT. So uh, I will definitely mention that to him. I think he'll be happy with his decision as well as, as was I. So um, coming to, uh, yeah. Now, one thing that most people fail to understand is that a startup is, and as Wish had mentioned in his pre previous uh, uh, presentation, it's still a business, right? At the end of the day, you are trying to create a business, and to do a business, you need to have structured your business in the form of a legal entity. Now, when we say legal entity, I, what I mean is uh, you have these five options proprietorship, partnership. Now, these are not really legal entities, these are the same character. I alone can start a proprietorship. I am liable for that proprietorship. It has no registration requirements, nothing. All I need is a, uh, a, a tax, ident a GST number or uh, a PAN and I am sorted. A partnership is, think of it as two proprietorships. Two people come together to create what we used to call back in the day a firm, a partnership firm. Now these are legal entities which do not have a legal character outside of the two individuals who, or the one individual who is forming part of that legal entity. So. In plain terms, if I am an owner of a proprietorship or I am a partner in a partnership, if the entity has any legal liability, I am personally legally liable for it. My personal assets are on the, uh, on the hook as well. The next legal entity you need to be aware of is a LLP. Now, a LLP is what the full form is limited liability partnership. What is it? It is taking all the parts of a partnership and a private company, they've merged it together to create a unique, the government has merged it together to create a unique legal entity called a legal uh, limited liability partnership. The next is a OPC, a one person company, which is a relatively new phenomena. And of course, as we all know, a private company. I won't get into public companies, listed companies, because I don't think it's relevant for our discussion today. So the things, proprietorship, partnership. Okay, so as a thumb rule, I never recommend these. The concept of unlimited legal liability scares the hell out of lawyers and they'll never recommend these to you. You'll have chartered accountants and other CSs who might recommend this to you. I as a lawyer never recommend uh, a partnership. If you don't have the capability of handling the corporate compliances, which I will talk about that, which you have in a private limited company at this point in your group, in your team, then I usually recommend creating an LLP. A LLP as a entity is, okay, so this will give you an idea of all of them, but a LLP as an entity is separate from its partners. You can do it with a minimum of two partners and it has a moderate legal compliance requirement. Now an LLP is generally useful because you don't have to have board meetings, you don't have to have uh, annual general meetings, you don't have to, you don't have, your, 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 your corporate governance compliance is limited to uh, filing your uh, partnership agreement, your LLP agreement and filing your tax returns at the end of the year along with a small one one page filing that you have to do with the ROC. The disadvantage of an LLP is, is that uh, it is not been the popular mode for scaling businesses up. So from my experience as a lawyer advising startups, I have seen most LLPs are there till you receive your first round of investment. A LLP is not a favorable vehicle for attracting investment in your, uh, in your business. So if you are developing a business which you believe you can de de develop without any external capital whatsoever or any institu institutional external capital, the LLP is the way to go. And that's the case. Every business is not a startup. You might be creating a small business which just you and your team can run with the amount of capital that you have access to with between yourself and your friends and family. LLP is the way to go. Don't bother with a private limited company. However, if you are looking to get incubated, you're looking to get uh, institutional funding, you're aiming for you know angel seed round, series A, the standard growth chart or funding chart which which people uh, which people take, then none of the other entities barring a private limited company is the way that you can go. So this is just a snapshot of the five different entities uh, and what are its 
features. So as you as I as I mentioned in the start, liability. Unlimited, unlimited for the last three limited. Legal entity, not separate from proprietor, not separate from partners, separate from its partners, separate from its shareholders, and separate from its shareholders again. What does that mean? That if I have a private limited company and somebody sues my private limited company, they're not suing me personally. My personal assets are not on the hook. Only up till the point the company's assets and what my contribution is to that to the company's assets in terms of mo monetary value. Then, yes, this is a very important concept. This has been one of the biggest hurdles for people to want to set up private limited companies was the minimum 1 lakh paid up capital. Basically, if you wanted to set up a private limited company earlier, before 2016, you had to invest 1 lakh of rupees in the company in cash, in actual cash, and take 10,000 shares back from the company. That's no longer required. They used to be minimum. Now you can even set up a company without any share capital. And when you have the money, you put in the share capital, 50,000, 75,000, 20,000, whatever you want, you can do so. The important thing is that the charter documents uh, for an LLP or an LLP agreement for a private limited company and an OPC, it's, it's called your MOA and your AOA. I'm sure you uh, are aware of these terms. The MOA is your memorandum of association that states the objects of your business, the objects of your company, which is what is your company incorporated for? What are the main and ancillary businesses which you believe your company will do? And your articles of association are actually your first shareholders agreement. People don't really picture the AOA as a shareholders agreement, but that's exactly what it is. It is the agreement between you and your second shareholder or your director, whoever starting the private limited company together, depending on two, three, four, how many other people, those are the terms that they are bound by. What you can do in terms of your share capital, can you issue preference shares, can you forfeit shares, can you issue ESOPs, all those things are contained in your AOA itself. And that's your first shareholders agreement really, it's the agreement between the founding members of a company. And yes, the compliances of a private limited company are high, just to name a few, you have to have four board meetings a year, you have to have uh, one AGM a year, you have to file uh, annual return, you have to file the director's report, these are all filings that have come into, into place. And quite honestly, they come into place very, uh, very uh, recently. Till 2014, we used to be governed by the Companies Act 1956, which was a, which was a much lower on compliance, uh, a much easier act to navigate. And there were many, 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 many loopholes which companies exploited since 1956 to 2014. The the main reason why it was changed and why compliance is extremely important now was actually a knee-jerk reaction to the Satyam scam. The moment the Satyam scam at the board level and at the audit level happened, the government came into action and said, okay, we need to make directors and the statutory auditors and shareholders and other employees uh, conscious of the fact that they owe what we call a fiduciary duty to disclose and uh, be transparent in the governance of their company. And that is actually what led to the, the, the new format of the Companies Act 2013 where there are large number of compliances that you need to follow while they, to a large extent for a small company, they may be just paper compliances. You need to, you need to get them done. You cannot be ignorant of them, which is why uh, we put a great amount of emphasis in our practice when we advise our clients on your corporate governance. We say, listen, you don't have to spend mental bandwidth on it, but you need to have a competent company secretary or lawyer helping you out, making sure that you are not falling foul of the law because that will forget about the fact that you might get a notice from the ROC in the future, which is the registrar of companies through the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. But your next investor might see these violations and mark down your investment in the, as a process or it might reduce your deal speed. They'll say, okay, you correct these things, you go to the ROC, you compound all these offenses and only then will we invest in your company because we don't want to invest in a company which has multiple defaults because our money will be used to uh, be paying fines and not to get the product developed. So uh, this is a brief snapshot of what you need to do if you are uh, setting up a LLP. You, ne you need two designated partners. Uh, the designated partners, one of them must be an Indian resident. So this is something new. Earlier, what you could do was even in the case of LLP, even in the case of company, you could have a foreign company which creates a subsidiary in India and puts two of its employees abroad as the directors of the Indian company. The new act stopped that from happening. At least one Indian resident must be there in uh, LLP as well as the uh, founding partner as well as in the uh, private limited company. The LLP agreement, very important. It is the basis of your relationship with your partner. All the, the uh, who, who's putting how much capital, who's the, the tech guy, who's the sales guy, who's the marketing guy, who's the operations guy who's the finance and business guy. Everything is supposed to be put in your LLP agreement so that the rights 
the roles, responsibilities, obligations of each of the partners is clearly laid out. Uh, yeah, so your profit sharing ratios, rights and responsibilities, all of this is very, very crucial. If you are uh, structured as an LLP, I recommend that you get your LLP agreement vetted by a lawyer or drafted by a lawyer so that it's very, very clear and there are no dispute. This is the only purpose behind this is to prevent disputes in the future uh, because of ambiguity. And that's what we believe lawyers, one of the first things we are taught in law school is ambiguity leads to disputes. Ambiguity leads to loopholes in your agreement allowing people to exploit uh, unfairly. So be very careful and be very clear about whose roles and responsibilities are what. Uh, this is a very important point which I believe has not been explored much by either VCs in our country or uh, even tech promoters and entrepreneurs and there's a lot of chance of doing some very creative structuring around LLPs is that one of the biggest reasons why LLPs since they came into force in 2008 are not being used by startups is that FDI was not permitted in LLPs without government approval. So if you guys understand the concept of foreign direct investment, there's a negative list. So there's a certain list of things which you cannot do through F with FDI without government approval. Then there's a whole list of everything else which you can do is called the 100% automatic route and any company abroad as well, any investor abroad can invest in an Indian company which is doing that business. I'll give you an example. I'm sure people have heard about this entire controversy about uh, multi-brand retail and single brand retailing. So basically that was the entire thing. Multi-brand retail not permitted which is why a Walmart cannot set up a sh shop like Reliance Fresh can. It's multi-brand retailing, right? Similarly, uh, so, so where this comes in is that earlier, if you were a private limited company doing X business, which was permitted under the automatic route, you could get FDI, no problem, no government approval required. You were doing the exact same business through an LLP, you needed government approval, which made no sense. This was thankfully corrected last year. So now, I believe because it was just corrected last year, not enough people have really taken a chance and experimented with the structuring LLPs for foreign investment but it's now possible. If you are working in a business which is in the 100% automatic route, you do not need to have a private limited company anymore to attract foreign investment, you can do it through an LLP but nobody is doing it as of now. Okay, this is also important but I will try to, like this is a little dry and procedural so I won't spend too much time, just quickly, you need minimum two shareholders, two directors, one of those directors has to be an Indian resident and they have to have a valid digital signature certificate and your charter documents have to be created prior to your incorporation. Uh, now, OPC. Now, if you are one of those uh, unfortunate few who has decided to go this alone and you have no partners, the, the, the Indian law now provides for something called a one-person company. It has everything the same as a private limited company which has two people but you can do it as OPC, as, as one person. The only difference is that you must get a nominee to who will prepare to step into your shoes in the event of your death or disability. That's the, literally the only difference. Otherwise, the OPC can do everything that a private limited uh, company of two people does. And the moment you get an investor into your OPC, it stops being OPC, it becomes a regular private limited company. Again, uh, I had a few challenges uh, incorporating OPCs when they first came out because the ROC, some of the uh, staff at the ROC themselves did not know how to go about it and they said, you know, it'll be just easier if you incorporate a private limited company. But thankfully, as things take some time, within six months of this amendment coming in, we saw the ROC itself also saying, okay, we are now in a position, we'll do OPCs as quickly as we do private limited companies as well. So this is something to be aware of that if you are doing business alone, the proprietorship is not the only way to go. I think, in fact, it's the worst way to go because you are fully legally liable yourself individually if you will go do business as a sole proprietor. Instead, go ahead and incorporate a OPC and work through that entity on your own. Even if you don't have a partner, you don't need to nominate somebody just for the sake of it. Basically, the next topic I wanted to cover, and I think I do have enough time for it, is basic principles of contract law. Now, that is something which every single business, it doesn't matter what you do, you will be given a contract at some point of time. If you're doing sales, if you are doing development, if you are outsourcing development, you will be entering into contracts for either receiving goods or services or selling goods or services, depending on what your business is. It is very, very important to understand what does it amount to, what, what does it legally amount to, say I have contracted with, party A has contracted with party B. You need first an offer. That means if I am contracting with party B, I need to offer something to party B. Party B, uh, also I say, I ask party B for service. In return, he will ask me for consideration. So that is the next thing, consideration. 
once i he has accepted my offer and i have accepted what consideration uh, he wants there has to be like i said acceptance so these are it's called a meeting of minds so a contract is nothing but a trail of documentation which shows that party a and party b had a meeting of minds on a on a particular topic for which they were transacting there was an offer and there was acceptance the other aspects of it are the ability to contract which is free consent lawful object and competence which means that neither was the contract coerced out of me i would nobody put a gun to my head and said sign this paper if that's done that is voidable under law uh that's free consent lawful object i cannot have a agreement with somebody for a illegal act it's not enforceable in law right so that's last one competence is that i was mentally competent or in this case in our case i was above the age of 18 because this law presumes that if you are under the age of 18 you are not legally competent to contract only your guardian or parent can contract on your behalf so these are concepts which are very important to understand not just from the perspective of okay i'm a lawyer i need to know all these things even as a as a business you need to understand that if your i have had clients who come to me whose product is catered to school children but they don't have a concept of uh, guardianship acceptance on their terms of use and their privacy policy because they copied it from somewhere else and that same product was for above 18 they created the similar product and made it catered for below 18 but copied the terms of use for the product which was for above 18 and they didn't have the concept of guardianship which meant that every single one of their agreements with the kids who were on their platform was void that tomorrow if the, if 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 somebody if the government wanted to come after them they could have there are many laws which protect the privacy and the safety of children online and they were in complete violation of it i don't know if people watch the tv show silicon valley here but there was a exact same situation that they came up with in that tv show as well and that's it's not unheard of now they took it to a exaggerated level because that's television but in real life it's not unheard of for companies to get notices under various laws because they did not have the correct clauses in their terms of use with respect to children and the privacy of children online so it's very very important for you to understand that that comes from the idea of competence a child is not competent to contract with uh, with anybody therefore you need to get guardian or parental consent to contract with that child these are the various types of commercial contracts that almost every startup will face at some point of time founders agreement now one may ask what is a founders agreement it is essentially your aoa but the aoas that generally you get from the mca website or the other end doesn't cover everything the 85% of the terms are covered but for the balance 15% you need to structure out if you want to structure vesting clauses with your co-founders you want to structure or uh, clawback clauses with your co-founders all of these things come into your founders agreement and it is extremely essential and i cannot uh emphasize this enough it is extremely essential that if you are have a private limited company and your team of 2 3 4 5 how many ever co-founders get a co-founders agreement in place so that if one of your co-founders leaves he doesn't leave with the shares he or she doesn't leave with the uh, ownership of the company there is a way to take that ownership back so that you can give it to somebody else who will come in employment agreement extremely important people just give offer letters and move ahead what you need to understand is especially again tech companies where you're hiring coders you're hiring system architects you're hiring people full stack developers anything that they create first technically belongs to them that is their intellectual property unless you have an employment agreement saying that anything they create belongs to you it's it's a very very important clause it's the concept of work for hire which means that if i have hired you to do a task for me the intellectual property of that task belongs to the person who has hired not the person who has created the intellectual property extremely important ndas i think it kind of speaks for itself confidentiality basically do not reveal confidential information that you have gotten of mine because of our business relationship almost every single vendor company you deal with first time you go for a sales contract for your product they will say we will not speak to you before you sign an nda right so that's extremely important your proprietary invention and assignment agreement you will if you are outsourced developers you will be made to sign these basically means what i said in the employment agreement that if i am hiring a third party to create intellectual property for me i need that third party to assign that intellectual property to me for me to have perfect ownership over that intellectual property i have had situations where a startup came to us saying we've received a term sheet from x vc for angel funding good amount we are sorted let's go ahead and negotiate this deal the vc did something called a technical diligence on the company they found out that all the tech in that company was outsourced and was high and was made by a company and they paid for it no problem but they did not have a, any agreement with that company 
in the absence of an agreement, the law presumes that they own the IP. Right? So the VC said, hold on. You don't have ownership over your intellectual property, which is the core of the asset for which we are pumping in money for you to develop so that you can hire more people to work off the base that you've already created. So sorry, we are withdrawing our term sheet. It's that important that you can create tech, get tech created, you can be smart guys on sales and business side, but if you don't own your tech as a tech company, you're not getting funded. It's very, very important. Payment gateway service provider agreements, again, if you do e-commerce, this is important, software development, website development, logistics service provider, vendor agreements, lease deeds. Lease deeds, people think that it doesn't really matter what a lease deed says or doesn't say. Uh, let me tell you, this has been a problem for VCs as well. They say your lease deed is not registered, it's not stamped, it doesn't have the correct clauses. Uh, you, you can technically be kicked out by your landlord at any given point of time. Leads to loss of business, leads to interruption in business continuity. Therefore, VC says, okay, I will only put my money in if you can get a signed stamped agreement with this particular landlord or any other landlord and move your office. Because I need surety that for the next three years, this is the cost. This is your rent output. I don't want to put in money and find out that you're go you, you have to move out, right? And pay double the money for a place of rent because that's eating into the, again, the operating capital to develop your product. So be very mindful of, uh, of agreements. And the last one is investment agreement. I'll try to get to that at the, by the end of my session. I may not have enough time, but uh, yeah. So an investment agreement, that's the agreement that you get from angel funds, networks, and VCs. Uh, all right, I think I've covered most of this. Let's come to terms and conditions. This is something which I am plagued almost on a on a daily basis, and even today, uh, by one of the speakers today who asked me very very kindly, and I've been asked this question hundreds of times, especially by engineers. Is that why do you guys use such complicated language in your terms of use and privacy policy? Uh, nobody reads it. So my only answer to that is we read it, the VC reads it, and. Believe me, when the company gets big enough, the government reads it. They ensure that your terms of use and privacy policy, and especially your privacy policy, is in conformance and in compliance with what we call the Information Technology Act and the rules underneath, which can result in, if your terms of use, if you are using what we call sensitive personal information under law, if you are using sensitive personal information in a manner not allowed, or you haven't put in the correct clauses in your privacy policy, you can be fined a lot of money by uh, the Ministry of Telecom. So you have to be extremely, extremely careful that your terms of use and privacy policy, one, are correct, two, are suitable for your business. So a uh, e-commerce company which is doing e-com, which is doing e-commerce in say 25 different categories cannot automatically copy Amazon or Flipkart's uh, uh, terms of use and privacy policy. It's been catered. People have spent time and thought and catered it directly for Flipkart's businesses. They're unique. Uh, uh, what, let's say they are logistics, they, are, they have end to end logistics as well. Your e commerce you, as a platform, you might be hiring your logistics from third lo logistics from third parties. They have hundreds of vendors, you might have three vendors. It makes a big, big difference. Each and every business has its own vagaries which require to be covered in your terms of use, and each and every business uses data in a different manner which need to be covered in your privacy policy. So, uh, no keep calm and control C, control V, absolutely not. For for abundant caution, always, always get your terms of use privacy policy either vetted by a lawyer or vetted by another industry person who may have, uh, uh, has understanding of uh, terms of use and privacy policies. Okay, other things that uh, your terms of use must have, trademarks, you must make it very clear in your terms of use that all trademarks, either registered or unregistered, belong and vest with your company. Linked sites, you have to make clear disclaimers that if your website links to other websites, that those websites are governed by their terms of use. That nothing that happens to you on that website can be taken up against uh, my company. Child protection, as I had mentioned. Governing law, you need to mention which law, law of India, law of wherever your company is incorporated. Dispute resolution and grievance redress. This is a very important thing, people forget it, but under law, you are required to have a grievance officer designated, named in each and every privacy policy of yours to ensure that if there is somebody who can be held accountable for that or if somebody has a grievance with respect to the usage of data that you have taken from them, they can contact the grievance officer. It's a requirement of law. And there are many, many startups which don't know that and don't put a grievance officer in your terms of use. So if you're an active startup, uh, here's some free advice. Whatever your terms of use and privacy policy is, if you don't have one, get one. Just get one and put a grievance officer at the bottom of it for now. Make sure that there is a contactable person 
either through email or through phone or through cor physical correspondence who can be reached in, t in case any user has a problem or a grievance against your uh, terms of use and privacy policy. Uh, this is like I said, sensitive personal information usage, I've already covered this and yeah, cookies, you have to have a cookie policy on your privacy policy. It is required under law for, for, for your users to know what all information is collected through, the, through cookie usage. Yeah, I think I have maybe five minutes to cover some basic fundraising uh, questions. Uh, okay, first and the most important thing, and I have, I can't tell you the number of times this has happened to me, is that when you get a term sheet, a term sheet is a non-binding agreement. Now, what, I, what do I call, what, what do I mean a non-binding agreement? It's a commercial agreement between two parties, investor and company. Investor is basically locking down the basic legal terms and commercial terms of the investment in the term sheet and that term sheet will follow on with a definitive agreement which is called a shareholders agreement, right? That is the next step of a term sheet. But the term sheet itself is non-binding but it is the basis of the commercial and legal negotiation between investor and company for the shareholder agreement. Do not sign any term sheet given to you by your inv uh, investor because the moment you sign that and then you try to negotiate against that in the shareholder agreement, you're not going to have a good time, you're not going to be able to negotiate. So this is what I tell every person who comes, who's come to me for investment advice, come, whoever your lawyer is, go to your lawyer when you get the term sheet. In fact, get all your negotiations out of the way at the term sheet stage itself. Then the rest of the process will move quickly and you will know your investor, investor will know you. They will know exactly where both of you uh, stand and there won't be any unfair surprises in the in the, in the in the future negotiations. And I guarantee you, I have fought with investors on the term sheet stage and after diligence is completed, shareholder agreement has gone beautifully smoothly because everything has already been ironed out. Everything is there in the term sheet. Conversely, I have been given term sheets by clients and at the negotiation stage of the shareholder agreement, I have had to argue and then I had no leg to stand on. They'll say your client signed it. We, uh, we, we informed them that this is the liquidation preference that we are asking for. They said, okay, 2x two, liquidation preference. Now you live with it. And it's very tough at that point in time. Now, if somebody had come to me with a term sheet, I looked at the liquidation preference and said, absolutely not. This is, this is, this is unfair. It's not market standard. So you have to understand that fund investment agreements are extremely complicated documents. And the term sheet is just a precursor of that extremely complicated document. Don't try to do it alone, especially if you do not have any finance or legal background. If you have a finance and legal background, I've seen enough startups they have a fi uh, finance guy who's joined them, they can handle it. It's not that difficult. But without the finance and legal background, especially engineers who I've met who are really brilliant people, but it's not necessary that you are, you, if you're good at your tech and good at your job as an engineer, you're going to be good at this as well. It's almost left brain, right brain. You know, the kind of things that you have to look at for this don't make sense to most, enge most engineers. So I would definitely recommend that a term sheet is studied very caref carefully with a finance or a legal uh, person. Signing the, uh, yeah, so be prepared for a commercial, technical, financial and legal diligence. This is what VCs and investors do before they invest in your company. They will check the commercial viability of your product, the technical viability of your product, the financial viability of your business and the legal viability of your, and the legal risks involved with your business. That is where we come in. The legal due diligence is what I do for my VC clients as well. We investigate into every aspect of a company. So like I said, those four board meetings I mentioned in the start, we've had companies which have had two board meetings a year. So violation of the Companies Act amounted to maybe somewhere in the range of only 50, 60,000 rupees worth of fines, but it allowed my VC to hammer, hammer the promoter and bring his valuation down. Saying you do not know corporate governance, I do not trust you to be able to govern this company properly if you couldn't have done it till now, and it becomes a bargaining chip in the hands of the VC. So the cleaner you keep your company, the easier the legal diligence and the financial diligence stage is. Uh, Signing your, your agreement is not closing. Signing of your agreement is equal to a legal obligation for them to invest the money once you complete everything that they've asked you to do. So investors will give you this long list of what they call conditions precedent to closing, which means that after signing the agreement and before receiving the money, you have to do A, B, C, D, E activities, which after which only they will invest their uh, money in the company. There is a lot of investment jargon. I will not, I don't even think I have that enough time to get into all of it. But that's one of them, the one I mentioned, CP closing and CS action items, that's condition subsequent. A lot of times ESOP pools and, you know, uh, other things like, um, 
actually like many other, other things i've just put in in a condition subsequent uh, category condition precedent are very very crucial legal things like entering into leases entering into employment agreements with the promoters uh, you know correcting any liabilities that may be there from the from the past this is a extremely extremely important aspect of it which is com sometimes completely ignored by uh, uh, promoters of their companies when they get first time vc funding is that unlike shareholding which means that if you have 51% ownership between the founder pool you still are in effective control of your company together right your board actually has nothing to do with your shareholding your board being a shareholder gives you a right to appoint a director now if an a board of directors works on a pure simple majority basis so let's assume that there are three directors two vote one way one votes one way the two the way the two people voted is how the vote gets carried right now assume you give your you are a single promoter yourself and you give your investor two board seats that means even though you might have given him 7 or 8% in your company you lost effective control over your company because you're no longer you're no, no longer on a majority of the board so be very careful before you give board rights a lot of vcs ask for board rights straight up front we say no most of our clients we advise them to say no we say only observer because that is the way you will be able to control your day to day they will ask for other rights so that they make sure that your their money is not being used incorrectly inspection rights audit rights they'll ask for them and give them but don't give board seats easily unless you're getting a fair chunk of money which is going to which is which is justifiable for them then to ask for a board seat because a board seat is a very very crucial aspect and being a board of uh, director member is a extremely crucial aspect of running a company and it's it's not something that comes straight up but it's it becomes very very important uh, down the line then there are a few uh, investor rights preemption i'll just quickly go through these so that you guys can understand conceptually what they are so that when you see these words you don't get confused preemption means that i am a 10% let's say i am sequoia i am a 10% investor in your company what this means is that the next round you raise i get a right to subscribe to at least 10% of that round so if your next round is uh, 10 crores i will have a right to subscribe to 1 crore out of that 10 crores so that i my percentage doesn't fall down i can maintain my percentage exactly where it is anti dilution now this is very important people don't even read this clause what this means is if i as sequoia bought shares in your company at 100 rupees a share and 6 months later you do a down round at 90 rupees a share that means that the next investor got more shares for the same amount of money or he spent less money for the same amount of shares all that means is that you as a promoter have to make good those that difference to me as the prior investor so i as a prior investor will take the promoter's shares and put it in my pocket because you did a down round it, it is there in every single uh, shareholder agreement i have negotiated in my uh, career and it is extremely extremely tough to uh, negotiate away what we do do is we say that okay if we do a down round in the next 2 years you get anti dilution protection if we do a down round after that you don't because that's the risk is proximate risk 2 years later if i haven't done a down round then and and we have to do a down round then it's for good reasons it's not because i suddenly burned through all your all the money that you gave so there's small small ways in which you negotiate these terms away but again these are very onerous terms which every vc will put on you right of first refusal which means that if you as a promoter are selling your shares you have to offer them to the vc or your investor first before you can offer them to third parties in the market tag along very very nice sounding clause but all it means is that if i i as a promoter try to sell my shares i offered them to you as the investor and the investor said no i find a third party to buy those shares investor says no 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 wait i am 10% you are 90% so for every 10 shares sold you will sell 9 i will sell one that's what tag along means so tag so that basically means that promoter cannot partially exit without the investor partially exiting as well drag along now this is a brahmastra which is put in your sha which uh everybody goes crazy when they see but it's i have yet to see it being enforced in india couple of times in silicon valley but never in india have i seen this enforced all this means is that after 5 7 years if i have not as an investor been given a financial exit from your company and i find a buyer for the entire company right so i as a 10% shareholder can go to a guy and say listen do you want to buy this company he says yeah sure no problem i i like the ip i like the assets i like the tech it didn't do well i think i'll make something of it this is the price i'm willing to pay i as an investor can drag the 90% promoters along with me 
Basically, what that means is that because the guy who's buying it doesn't want to buy my 10%, he wants to buy the entire company. My 10% is going to do nothing for him. So he says, if you can get the other promoters on uh, board, great. Ask them to sell them, sell my shares. I will acquire the entire company. That's what drag along does. And investors only use it theoretically when they can't get a proper financial exit, where they get a 1.2x, 1.5x, 2x return on their capital. Then they'll take a 0.8x, 0.7x return, but they will get there because funds. You must understand have a 5 to 7 to 9 year cycle. They have the first 3 4 years they invest. Last 4 years they exit and that's how a fund is closed and returns can be given to the limited partners of the fund. So they have to exit. They cannot stay invested in a company in perpetuity. Financial investors. So you must understand that they will exercise a drag if you as a promoter are not able to give them a sufficient exit. Liquidation preference. Liquidation preference means that if the company is being liquidated, I as an investor get the first bite of the cherry. Whatever is left after that is left for the promoter. So let's say I invested 1 crore rupees in your company and when you sold the company, you fetched 1.2 crores. Liquidation preference means I will take my 1 crore principal, balance 20 lakhs left for you promoters to do with what, with what, what you want with it. Affirmative voting right. Now this is another extremely potent weapon in the arsenal of VCs. Uh, even if I'm a minority shareholder in your company, I can block certain things that the company wants to do. It means a veto. They'll give you a laundry list of 10, 12 things that your company cannot do without my affirmative consent. Which means that unless I say yes, you cannot do X, Y, Z. If you want to do X, Y, Z, I have to say yes. If I say no, you cannot do it. So for example, a pivot. We, we love using the word pivot. Company has pivoted to do X, Y, Z other thing. Your pivot can only happen with the consent of your investor. It cannot happen without the consent of your investor. CapEx. You have a CapEx budget of 25 lakhs that year. You want to spend 45 lakhs. Cannot do it without your investor's consent because it's his money. These are all various things that you have to be uh, aware of. And information, information and inspection rights I've spoken about. It basically means the right to audit and uh, look at the company's books, finances, uh, legal compliances to ensure that everything is on board. Yeah, I think this I had planned, but due to paucity of time, I'm not going to talk about Startup India. I think there's a session slotted for tomorrow for Startup India specifically itself. So I think I'll leave it at that. And yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to uh, ask me. So uh, like when you are in business, you do a lot of NDAs left, right and center, right? Yeah. So like a uh, customer would say, I'm sending you a NDA on paper, you take a print and you send me a signed copy back and and I'll send you a signed copy. Does that even hold in the courts? Okay, so yeah, so that's a very, very good question. So uh, this has been challenged many times, but as long as it's done on stamp paper, even if it's executed separately and a scan is sent back and then you execute on or sign on that, it's, it's impossible. But what I would recommend is always to do physical executions either if you're together, sign it together. If you can't, then there are new solutions in the market which uses e-Aadhaar for uh, 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 digital signature, right? So you can actually now execute documents remotely using your Aadhaar card and your Aadhaar number. But that's going to be only with Indian entities, right? Correct, so with Indian entities. Yeah. Uh, external entities, yes, I, I can see the challenge, but uh, it's most courts will, uh, will, if you can show a mail trail showing that they, so you have to be able to prove the existence and the validity of the document in court if it comes to litigation, right? Yeah. If you can show a mail trail from their server to yours, which yeah. is very easy to show, and that document came from their server to yours, you can show that there's consent. Just to answer your question, you don't actually need a written contract yeah. to get it enforced in court. If tomorrow I send you an email saying, I offer you 10,000 rupees for you to do X, Y, Z, yeah. you say, okay, you do X, Y, Z, and then I don't pay you, you can show those emails. They actually amount to a contract. Because right. there was a meeting of minds. I offered you something, you accepted and you did the work. You actually don't need a written contract, even if you can show email correspondence, uh, uh, electronic uh, uh, signing, sorry, electronic and scanning and sending, all these things are very much admissible in court. No, so the other thing is that these companies do a lot of these TOS agreements which you just click and do agree. <coughs> Correct. And click this is and your, all your license And a lot in case of yeah. B2C things, right? Correct. How enforceable are those? Impossible. Absolutely how, impossible. how it is to be proven that is this person who has agreed on that agreement? Well, this person has agreed on, so I understand your point there, but the presumption is that if it was done from, okay, so let's take an app, let's take any app, yeah. right? I accept, I have to accept the terms before I am allowed to, so I, I download without accepting any terms, but before I use, 
I have to either sign in through Facebook credentials or I have to create a login ID, etc. And I click on I accept. It's called a click wrap or a shrink wrap agreement, yes. right? The reason why it is impossible is it is presumed that you have control over your device. They're not going to presume fraud. If somebody else has taken your phone, downloaded an app and clicked I accept, that is your fault. You did not keep control over your device. That's not the fault of the person who's sitting and providing the service through the app, mm. right? So the law presumes that you have control over your immovable property, your computer and your uh, and your phone. So it is absolutely enforceable but the, uh, because there's no other way for a company to contract with consumers at large if you're going to make everybody sign an agreement. I agreed. So uh, so we are an IT company, IT services company. So if we provide software solutions to other companies. Okay. So uh, let's assume that we have not signed a proprietorship code agreement mm. that you mentioned, mm. and we are the technically we are the proprietor of the code. Mm. So if we uh, don't mention the privacy policy or any other policy properly, mm. are we liable for that, or is the company that is getting the tech done uh, liable for that? See, the company is always going to be liable for their their privacy policy, their business. At the end of the day, you are not the one doing the business. You are just an outsourced developer who developed it and gave it back to them. Now, whether you own the IP or not is irrelevant for the privacy policy. Okay. And the IP ownership is also contestable. If they've paid you, if they paid you in check, right, they can make a claim that the presumption of law is in their favor. But if they haven't paid you, then it's assuming, it's fair assumption that the IP is, belongs to you. But the privacy policy is never your problem. It is always the company who is implementing that IP is their problem. And let's say if we have an agreement that we have to do a privacy policy on their behalf. Then there's a, then there's then, a, yeah. then, then contractually they can say that while legally the liability is on me, I had a contract with party B, they were supposed to craft my, uh, my privacy policy. So let's say government puts a fine of 1000 rupees on me for a fault of yours. The government is still not going to go after you because the, the, the government is going to go after the owner of the business which had the faulty privacy policy. After I've paid the government fine, I can contractually go after you for that. Under contract, under civil law, under I will file a suit for recovery of that amount of money from you. But I, I will not say, okay, government, he made it, you go after him. Government won't, the, nobody will care because the, the concept of privity of contract. The privity of contract here is between you and the public at large because you are putting out a product with a privacy policy. There's no privity of contract between you and the public. You are just developing that uh, uh, privacy policy for him. So, Take for example, if I develop a privacy policy for a company, and they implement it and they get fined for it, the, they can't come after me, as in the, the person who's fining cannot come after me. Maybe the company can come after me for deficiency, deficiency in service, but I don't have any direct liability in that, in that situation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone.